Okay, um, today is Christmas Day, and being the total motorcy motorcycle geek that I am, um, I decided I had to uh, check um, my motorcycle news for the day, and um, I just happened to stumble somehow across uh, what I thought was an interesting article about the Unit Pro Link suspension on the new CBR1000. The 2014 CBR 1000 saw an article on that, and I said, "What the hell is with this Unit Pro Link?" I've been trying to understand Unit Pro Link for a while. Um, a lot of people have been talking about it. I've seen a lot of diagrams about it, and I googled it, and I saw this uh, old um, forum, 2007, where some people were arguing, "What the hell is Unit Pro Link about?" So then I found on Honda's page. Finally, a good explanation of Unit Pro Link, and it was really kind of interesting, and it was tied in some notes about the um, uh, the 2014 CBR 1000, and considering that my quote unquote new 12R is finally ready for the road, and um, the whole debacle with the eBay purchase and everything, uh, I immediately felt some you know buyer skill over buying an old bike uh, and spending so much money on it in the end. Some of which I hope to get back from one of Edward Snowden's contemporaries, or should I say, um, peers. Let's put it that way. Um, uh, there's. I just thought it would be neat to put together a video covering some of these um, uh, technical differences between the 2013 and 2014 models, especially since I've seen so many reviews online on on YouTube and so forth for people who just had really little, either didn't have a good understanding of what they were talking about in terms of these uh, vehicles. I mean, you see Jay Leno covering the new Stingray and, oh, the engine is just completely different than the old engine. It's like, yes, it's not just completely different. There's a whole host of changes beyond even, you know, overhead cam V8 engines and stuff like that. Um, but let me just cover a couple of these, which I think are really interesting. Um, people have always talked about, well, you know, um... Super bikes are super bikes. They're not really all that great for the road. They're not really all that great. You know, they're really optimized for the track. You should ride them on the street. And I think this whole debate is one thing that people uh, love to tell other people that they shouldn't buy super bikes. They shouldn't buy super bikes for the first bike. They should. What bike should they buy for their first bike? What's a good starter bike? All these kind of things. You have so many people out there talking about stuff they really don't understand and trying to give advice to people at the same time, which is. It's horrible to sit here and listen to people who don't know what the hell they're talking about. They're not logical at all. Give advice to beginners. It's just an awful thing to see. It's, it's as bad as a guy at the bus stop trying to give directions. You know, someone, a girl who just came to a large city, coming into Port Authority in New York, lands, you know, at JFK or lands, at, gets off the bus, the Greyhound bus terminal, walks up to a guy in complete naivete, naivete Walks up to some guy she sees there and asks him for directions to a decent, low price hotel. You're just, <laughs> you've no idea what you're getting into by doing that. Um, similarly, I won't say it's a, you know, obviously it's not quite that bad, but similarly, as a beginner or a technical newbie who sees someone riding motorcycles, sees, talks to my riders, talks to people on bikes, and decide they want to get into biking. Just going on to YouTube and asking people or reading these, uh, looking at these videos and asking for advice on what bike to buy is a disaster. You're asking for like a just recipe. It's just asking to get screwed. And that's half the issue. But as a more or less intermediate rider, technical person, I like to talk about the, the 14 um, CBR 1K because it does have some interesting technical differences from some of the other bikes out there that for a $14,000 sport bike um, are pretty interesting and pretty, I think, of a good value, especially when you start talking about 16, 17, 18, 20, 25, 30, $60,000 sport bikes. You, you, it just is really interesting to look beyond ABS, um, traction control, uh, dynamic, dynamic suspension control, things like that, which some of these more advanced bikes have um, you know, engine mapping, uh, uh, fly-by-wire throttle control, things like that, which a lot of bikes have, but what are the real differences between all the implementations of these systems? Do they really explain to you why this 
you know, the HP4 is better than the, the 1199 Patagalli or, or the MV Augusta or the uh, RSB4 or the R1 or the, um, the Z, ZX10R. You know, why would all these bikes have pretty much the same technology in the sense that they have any ABS, like I said, ABS, steering dampers, dynam some, most don't have dynamic damping control, let's put it that way, but still... Um, the HP4 is probably unique in that regard. Uh, quite a few bikes have uh, dynamic steering damping, which I think is a very important and useful thing to have um, if you're going to have damping. You don't want to have fixed damping unless you turn it down you know, so low that it's, it's only of marginal utility. To get full utility, you do need to have some kind of active or at least semi-active damping, um, ABS, that kind of thing. Same with the suspension, same with the engine, all these things you really want to have some kind of at least semi-active system, okay? Otherwise, you end up with a, a bike that's tuned for one particular riding regime. It's not stiff enough in others, and it's too stiff in most, okay? Um, you end up tuning it for 70% riding. $15,000 is a lot of money to spend on a motorcycle to have it only optimal for some or even i'll say okay maybe most but some is not what you want you want it to have optimal for most if not all of your riding regimes so let's look at just the cbr 1k okay for 2014 and i can see going into this for all bikes but hey honda did a good job on their website and i'm going to read off some of the stuff on their website and cover um some of the technical information starting with the unit pro link suspension now as I show here in, I guess I hopefully won't have that up for the entire time that I just talked about. Um, the Unit Pro Link suspension essentially allows Honda to take the shock absorber, disconnect it from the back of the frame, encapsulate it entirely in the, in the uh, swing arm, and isolate the suspension loads, the, tors the twisting loads of the swing arm around the swing arm mount, from the frame, okay? The whole idea is to take all of those loads and take them off the frame directly. You want to put also, they have the side benefit of taking the swing arm, I mean the, the, the um, shock absorber itself and the shock and the coil, the rear spring, and lowering it, okay? So the lower you get it, the lower the center of gravity, and moving it far back and lowering it allows them to isolate all that mass from within the frame and it allows them to tune the frame for handling for better handling that's the whole point of unit pro suspension the unit pro link okay it is not just some tricky marketing gimmick which a lot of people seem to think it is because they haven't seen a good or heard a good explanation of it it says right here on the web page explains everything in fairly good detail not too technical but technical enough it allows them to get the shock out of the middle of the frame Stiff um, allows them to, to optimize the stiffness of the frame, and it allows them to um, lower the center of mass. Okay, so I should throw a link up here at some point to, to demonstrate that. So moving on, okay, they talk about a change to the rear shock itself. Now Olin's is world renowned for really great shocks, but the Japanese make shocks themselves. They don't make bad, you know, some really bad shocks. You've got the Showa and the Tokiko brakes, and you've got um, uh, Brembo, Brembo, I guess, pronounced, pronunciation may be throwing me here, Brembo uh, is world-renowned for its monoblock mono brake calipers for the front, and I suppose for the rear. But uh, the Japanese obviously don't want to have, <laughs> you know, the Italians be um, the people they turn to for top-notch uh, motorcycle components when they're making the motorcycle. They want to make the top-notch components and put them on their own bike, and I would assume that the same thing will happen to the Chinese eventually when the Chinese get off their um, whatever kick they're on now where they're making these bikes which are just not very competitive. I'm sure they will be competitive at some point. Um, I'm sure at some point they will be, you know, if trends continue, past trends continue, they will be cheaper and quite capable motorcycles, if not quite as good as the Japanese. Obviously, uh, if you're a European manufacturer, you need your motorcycle to be even better than the Japanese if you're going to justify the expense of making your, your motorcycle in Japan, or you're going to end up basically outsourcing all the, motor, the manufacturing to China and, you know, in whatever 
uh, low labor cost environment you can find um, to reduce the cost of the components then just putting your Italian name on it and or your German name on it and rise, raising the price as a result um, American manufacturers are, are somewhat trapped in that same thing where why should people buy an American uh, designed if not manufactured motorcycle when you pay high labor cost for uh, American made parts and the engineering is not that great so the Japanese have and the Honda certainly makes a, a, a good solid bike across their line so they've come up with their um, new show of for us um, sorry um, rear shock which addresses another issue which is for a long time confused me or at least I haven't understood exactly what the hell is going on with it which is shock hysteresis so they have a diagram here uh, on the page right under the um, Unipro link which explains the hysteresis effects and explains how their new shock uh, addresses hysteresis and also um, allows them to tune fine-tune the shock performance better and it's a very good explanation here um, and you can see clearly the hysteresis that results from uh, traditional shocks I'm sure Olin's has some shock which does something along these lines with this separate canister um, allowing him to redu reduce the hysteresis of the shock performance versus as terms of stroke versus compression or damping uh, force it explains that very well and um, uh, obviously without having to upgrade your shock to Olin's shocks in the aftermarket since you get this benefit with the Han so and um, that's a good thing uh, Olin's ex who knows how much Olin's uh, forks and shocks cost but obviously they're not cheap compared to the stock parts or people would have them you know as an upgrade almost instantaneously uh, but again you don't want to spend a lot of money upgrading the parts in, that come on your bike that are um, OEM if you don't need to um, 